Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Secrets and Spies present Need to Know. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. This is Need to Know. On today's Need to Know, I'm joined by former CIA officer and Peabody award-winning journalist, Frank Snepp. And we discuss the alleged Russian bounties paid to the Taliban to target American and allied soldiers. As regular listeners would have noticed, we've been going through a rebranding exercise. So this podcast was formerly the Dry Cleaner cast. It is now Secrets and Spies. If you like this podcast, please consider supporting it by becoming a Patreon subscriber. If you go to patreon.com forward slash secrets and spies, you can support this podcast. Also, if you like the work that I'm doing, you may enjoy my short film, The Dry Cleaner. The Dry Cleaner is my first attempt at spy fiction, and it's available now on Amazon and iTunes. Don't forget to connect with us on social media. You can go to facebook.com forward slash secrets and spies. Or you can connect with us on Twitter by going to at Secrets and Spies. You'll tend to find me on Twitter more than Facebook. So if you want to drop me a line, come to Twitter. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and thank you very much for listening. Take care. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Frank, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Great to, great to have you back on. Um, Frank, for the benefit of new listeners, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I was uh, recruited into the CIA in 1968. I was uh, first charged with uh, handling NATO affairs on the analytical side, then reassigned to Vietnam, where I served multiple tours up until the last days of the war. I re- rose to become the senior CIA analyst on North Vietnamese strategy. I briefed ambassadors. And during an interim tour, I wrote for the President's Daily Brief. I was heavily involved in a very secret operation into North Vietnam. So I was one of these strange birds who was not merely an analyst, having access to highly classified information in the President's Daily Brief, but I also had operational responsibilities, including interrogating prisoners and uh, helping to manage uh, deep penetration operations. Uh, Very few people have been in that sort of dual position in the agency for the very reason that it's a very dangerous security risk because if somebody like me turns bad, he walks away not only with analytical information, but he, he walks away with sources and methods. And compartmentalization within the agency normally keeps the analyst and the operative separate. I was somebody who embodied the functions of both and probably uh, have I persuaded the CIA not to go that way again because I did finally become a whistleblower and call the agent to account for mistakes it had made in Vietnam with a book uh, that uh, became a bestseller and an embarrassment to the agency. Mm. A few weeks ago, a story broke in the New York Times claiming it had been discovered the Russian government had been paying bounties to the Taliban to target US and allied forces in Afghanistan. There has been an understandable shock and condemnation in the US and in the UK when the story first broke. President Trump's reaction to the story has been to claim ignorance and to claim that he was never briefed by US intelligence officials about any of this. And some have argued that this is just a reaction by Russia against what it sees as American bullying and expansion into its zones of influence. So, Frank, I wanted to ask you today sort of what your thoughts are on this story. Well, I think the important thing is that it was leaked at all. Mm. Um, The leakers strike me as insiders within the U.S. intelligence community who were fed up 
with Trump's inaction, his bashing of the intelligence community, and the leaks that revealed this story, the story of the the Putin bounties, was their way of bringing Trump to heel. And I think that's as much uh, a part of this saga as the substance of the leaks themselves. The story that they leaked is breathtaking. First part, that operatives for the GRU, the same unit which had meddled in the U.S. elections, basically began probably around 2018 paying bounties to Taliban militants, bounties to target Americans. At about that same time in early 2018, American troops operating in Syria had killed some Russian mercenaries. And it's very possible the bounties were immediately a response to that affront that Putin figured, why not avenge that bloodletting? The bounty offerings may have been Putin's way of answering Uh, those killings in Syria. But in any event, that's the first part of the story, which the leakers revealed to the American public beginning on uh, June 26 of this year. And the second part of the story, which Mm. was revealed by the leakers, is that Trump simply sat on his hands every time he heard about it. There were about four instances in which he was briefed either in writing or orally, on the bounty story, and he did nothing about it. And that is as much a scandal, of course, as was the bounty offerings themselves. Um, And these, these invisibles within the intelligence community who were responsible for the leaks handled it like a Cywar operation. I was fascinated to watch it as a veteran of the intelligence business. What they did was, with the first leak, to tempt Trump into denying that he'd ever been briefed. And the next brief of the next leak revealed that he had been briefed. So he was caught out in a lie. Then there were complaints from the White House that it was not very good intelligence, that it hadn't been actionable. And the next leak proved that not only was it actionable, but that special forces, the U.S. Central Command, the U.S. intelligence community had acted on this information, the initial reports of the bounties. So the the leakers who reveal this story in basically the American press, although The Guardian picked up on some of the sidebars. These leakers were doing something very important. They were operating as insiders, and they were trying to correct the president's course. And in the process of making these revelations public, they provided us with a blistering indictment of Trump's fitness for office. He didn't act. He didn't act to help U.S. servicemen. And they also, these leakers, provided fresh evidence that he's an owned and operated subsidiary of Putin Incorporated. Because clearly, if anything should have induced him to speak out against uh, what Putin was doing, the bounty story was it, and yet there was nothing from the president. It also raised a very interesting question about what the intelligence community itself is doing now in the United States. Trump has often said it was, uh, it's, a, it's a deep state. It's been out to get him. And these leaks from clearly intelligence insiders made it seem that there was a cabal inside the U.S. government that was out to embarrass Trump. I don't really read their motives that way. I believe these guys, these leakers, these people from the U.S. intelligence community were doing exactly what intelligence operatives are supposed to do. They're supposed to get at the truth and then let us know what it is so that we can keep on staying free. And uh, that's exactly what these leaks were all about. So although I'm an apostate in the intelligence Uh, circles. I'm somebody who's spoken out against the intelligence community very vigorously. In this particular instance, I think the leakers are the best of the best. I think that they've done exactly their patriotic responsibility in letting us know what's been going on. Let's look at for a moment as at how these leaks, or more to the point, how the bounty program itself developed. 
In early 2019, by all the available information and according to a White House memo that has been re recently released in response to the leaks, according to all these sources, in early 19, Taliban mil militants uh, let slip to the CIA, I think in interrogations, perhaps through uh, incepted, intercepted communications, that bagmen from Moscow were handing out bounties for American scouts. That's in early 2019. The U.S. Central Command immediately began scavenging for details, and the president was promptly alerted to this news. That's very important. It's the first time he received such a warning. Keep that in mind. There are a number of instances in which he will be warned of the bounties, and since he's now claiming he never heard about them, it's sort of, sort of important to line up the, the instances, at least on the public record, where we can say, yes, he, he did receive warning of this. The first time was in early 2019, uh, more than a year before it became public. At the same time, early 2019, John Bolton, his national security advisor, briefed him orally on it. So there was lots of noise very early on that should have prompted Trump to take action, to go to Putin and say, hey, what the hell is going on here? And all the more so because, again, early 2019, there was an attack on American convoy outside of Bagram Air Base yeah. in Afghanistan. And three Americans were killed. I think there were three civilians also killed. There were servicemen from some other component from the Marines, different from the Marines. But six people got hit. There was a car bombing. And immediately, U.S. intelligence concluded, number one, that Taliban was responsible. Number two, that this was an expression, this was a response to the bounties. So we not only have information on the bounties in early 2019, but we have what looks like a response to the bounty offers by the Taliban itself. This is heady stuff, and you would think immediately Trump would react, but he didn't. He sat on his hands. Even after the Americans were killed, it's almost unimaginable that he would have done so, but he did. And I think it's important to pause for a minute because it's a, such a dramatic development with the GRU operatives offering bounties on Americans. Why would, why would Putin opt for such a provocative policy? He could have maintained a low profile. It's almost as if he were sticking his thumb in Trump's eye. And I think, number one, you know, he was copying us in the 1980s, wasn't he? Uh, yeah. We had armed, the CIA had armed the Mujahideen yeah. to fight Soviet forces. Turnabout is fair play. Uh, possibly, too, Putin had soured on the support he gave us after 9-11. He became disenchanted with the, the American policy of seeking out the Al-Qaeda terrorists and, and their ISIS allies, hmm. and he wanted us out. He wanted to take our place in Afghanistan, and he was currying favor with the Taliban. In fact, he had been arming the Taliban with excess AK-47s at least for two or three years, and that had drawn the attention as early as 2017 of the U.S. military. Uh, General John Nicholson had uh, briefed the press, had briefed Congress on these arms sales by uh, the Russians to the Taliban. So Putin was already poking us in the eye. And here, here he is offering bounties as well. I think, too, it's very possible the bounty program was designed to avenge a bloodletting that uh, Putin's uh, oligarch friend uh, had suffered. His mercenaries operating in Syria had taken casualties in an attack by Americans in 2018. And so it, here was Putin responding to that, that a particular offense. Uh, bounties were one way to do it. I think that there was another reason that Putin felt he could act. Let's say the bounty started, it, it appears that they were in effect as of early 2018. 2018 
was a seminal year for the Mueller investigation. Trump was uh, cornered by that investigation. Mueller was seeking out uh, key witnesses, focusing on two in particular. And I think that Putin felt that because Trump was so cornered, he could do anything he wanted to. He could get away with almost anything he wanted to. I'm going to come back and look at more in more detail at the effect the Mueller investigation had on the bounty program and on how Putin felt he could operate with impunity. But suffice it to say for the moment, I, I believe that because Mueller investigation was so alive and so vigorous in 2018, that, that Putin felt that really Trump was incapable of responding to anything Putin might do. And so Putin said, the heck with it. I'm just going to push as far as I can. Well, a year later, in 2019, the game began heating, heating up a little bit more. Um, the administration joined Russia, China, and Pakistan calling for an Afghan peace. This was the first signal that we were moving towards some kind of peace deal and U.S. withdrawal in truth from Afghanistan. And the president got his second his second on-the-record briefing on the bounty program. And again, he kept silent. Why did he? It's very possible, giving him the benefit of the doubt, that he kept silent because he was trying to buy some quiet time for U.S. operatives to get more information on the bounty mm. program. It's interesting as well, considering he is a president of the Republican Party, and the Republican Party tend to push themselves as very sort of hot and national security. It's just a very curious reaction from a Republican president, is it not? It is indeed, mm. and I think some Republicans were disquieted mm. by what was going on. But it, remember, at this particular time, this is sort of below the radar. Mm. The, the bounty program had not become public, that sure enough, Putin's arming of the Taliban mm. was becoming public because people operating with U.S. forces in Afghanistan, the U.S. commander there, had spoken about it now twice as of 2019. So there should have been pushback from Republicans in Congress. It's very hard to convey to uh, people who don't live in the United States, mm. to you guys abroad, just how slavishly deferential the Republican Party has become to Trump. Lindsey, Lindsey Graham, mm. who's been a hawk on most things Russian, mm. uh, sat on his hands too, didn't say anything about it, didn't respond to the arming of Taliban forces. Now, there are one or two others, uh, uh, Corey Gardner, Senator Cory Gardner began to contemplate legislation which would determine that the Russians were state sponsors of terrorism, just the way the United States views Iran mm. and uh, Pakistan mm. as state sponsors of terrorism. So there was some movement, but not very vigorous movement on the part of uh, Republicans in Congress when these reports of uh, Russian arms to the Taliban began to surface because uh, Trump didn't want to do anything. And Trump was leading the show. Mm. And there's another reason I think that the response was muted on the part of the Republicans. And that's because the U.S. Com intelligence community wasn't sounding the alarms publicly. Yeah. And I think it's very possible that in early 2019, the U.S. intelligence community, which was still looking for details on the bounty operation, may have downgraded the threat to Trump mm. because they didn't want him to say too much. They didn't want him to open his mouth and blab to his friend Putin. And very honestly, they had good reason for such caution. Uh, remember back just a few months after uh, Trump took office, he blurted out Israeli secrets yeah. in an Oval Office meeting with uh, the Russian ambassador and foreign minister. Mm. And it, the leak was devastating to the Israelis and to our shared counterintelligence operations, our joint counterintelligence operations with the Israelis. It revealed that they had, uh, in fact, created an intercept program that identified a terrorist operating against Israel. Mm. And here the president just threw the secret away. And it created shockwaves in the U.S. intelligence community and in allied intelligence agencies. Mm. 
And so there was reason to worry that Trump might be inclined just to say too much. And, and there was another reason. The U.S. intelligence community may have been wary of feeding too much information to Trump. And that is, in 2018, mm. he had ordered the U.S. intelligence community to the horror of agents and operatives to begin sharing counter-terror information with the Russians. Yeah. Now, this, this particular propensity of his wasn't so unusual. After 9-11, the United States had begun sharing some counterintelligence data with the Russians because the Russians offered to help us go after al-Qaeda. And the mm. Bush administration from time to time explored the idea of sharing information with the Russians for counterterror purposes. So did the Obama administration. Trump's short-lived first national security advisor, Michael Flynn, mm was very big on sharing information with the Russians. And in fact, soon after he became national security advisor in um, uh, late 2016, he um, proposed that this exchange take place. And he mm. urged the Pentagon to begin handing secrets, counter-terror secrets to the Russians. The idea fell afoul of the law, which says that there can be such intelligence sharing by military agencies of the U.S. government and Russian ones only if there is a waiver from the Secretary of Defense and Congress is alerted. So Flynn's idea of sharing fell, went nowhere. And the earlier efforts to share petered out. Mm. What Trump did was in early 2018, he said, look, uh, since the Pentagon's not supposed to do it, I want the CIA to do it. And the CIA reluctantly began turning over secrets, counter-terror secrets to the Russians. And we now know from a recently published story that the Russians didn't reciprocate. They simply yeah. used the exchanges as a way of teasing out information on CIA sources mm. and methods. Mm. Given that experience, the U.S. intelligence community, and given Trump's own closeness with the Russians, his propensity for trashing the U.S. intelligence mm. community, I think it's very likely the U.S. intelligence community may have soft-pedaled some of the early information on the bounty program that they were picking up. And as of early 2020, they were picking up quite a lot. Mm. The SEAL Team 6 raided a Taliban hideout. They snagged a $500,000 dollars in cash. Analysts surmise the money was meant for bounty payments. Yeah. Uh, operatives captured cell phones. They captured middlemen. They picked up NSA, picked up communications, tracking bounty money or what seemed to be bounty money. So there was all suddenly there was this outflowing of information that seemed to validate all the earlier tips and rumors mm -hmm. that Putin was offering bounties for American bodies mm. in Afghanistan. And so we had a perfect storm in early 2020. We had the intelligence agencies pulling together, corroborating each other, and most importantly, Trump was again briefed on the bounty program. It appeared, the warning appeared in his President's Daily Brief, that's his daily news bulletin, highly classified, most classified of all such documents. Mm. On February 27th, he got that information. Mm. He got it. So there's no way that Trump can ever claim, and this is the third time he's gotten such a warning, at least that we know on the public record. Yeah. So he's definitely clued in. And again, again, he did nothing. Now, two days later, the U.S. struck a tentative peace accord with the Taliban looking towards withdrawal of U.S. forces mm. in 14 months from Afghanistan. So it's mm. possible that Trump was short or soft peddling his concerns about the bounty program because he wanted he didn't want to do anything to upset the peace deal. Yeah. Let's give Trump at least that. Yeah. But 
I think it's very possible there was something else mm. going on here. Mm. And I, there are things about the PDB brief on on uh, the 27th of February yeah. that suggests that something else was going on. I, and, and, and I want to pause and focus on this a little bit okay. because I'm drawing on my own experiences as an intelligence officer. I was a briefer mm. in the CIA. My audience was uh, high-ranking officials, ambassadors, uh, and what have you. I didn't brief the president, but I did write for the president's daily brief, Mm. particularly in 1971. I knew exactly how that operated. Normally, president's daily brief items Mm. come with an accompanying oral brief Mm. so that the president can be made aware that this intelligence is, is extremely important. He should pay attention to it. The brief that that Trump received in writing on February 27th did not come with an oral brief. It was just a written brief. And when I learned that, I I said to myself, something is wrong Mm. here because this is one time and we've just gotten all this operational data. We've picked up $500,000 $500,000 in cash. We've been doing these intercepts. We've interrogated prisoners. And I think to myself, well, surely this should have been made known to the president. But then if you're worried that the president is a leaker and he's too close to Putin and you're a high-ranking CIA official, you may say to yourself, you know, we got a lot of operational details here. Mm. And if I give an oral brief to the president to accompany the written PDB brief. He's going to have a chance to ask a lot of questions. I'm going to have to possibly get into operational details, that sources and methods stuff. Mm -hmm. And Trump could load up on a lot of stuff that would be catnip to Putin Mm -hmm. if he leaked it to him. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a CIA guy, senior guy, I'm going to say to myself, you know, I'm just going to include what I need to in the president's daily brief, go so far and no further. Mm. Since we know Trump has an aversion to reading, Mm. it's possible these cautious CIA officials reason that this item in the PDB might not even be noticed Mm. by the president. Interesting. As I contemplated all of these possibilities, I thought to myself, well, something else was going on. What if what senior CIA officials, these concerned citizens worried about Trump's closeness to Putin? Mm. What if what if they were playing a longer game? Mm. What if they were preparing for a leak campaign designed to bring the president back into line? to jolt him into action against Putin, then it's very possible they viewed this PDB brief, hypothetically, but they viewed it as a potential ticking time bomb. And they knew it would be ignored, and therefore they could build a leak campaign around it to demonstrate the president was falling down in his job and to shame him into being more proactive with Putin. Now, this is a lot of second guessing and mm. what have mm. you, mm. but the reality is that's exactly what happened. Mm. That's exactly how the leak campaign they mounted played out. And here's how what happened. After the PDB brief, there was a National Security Council meeting yeah. in which the members began discussing a menu of options for responding to Putin and his bounty program. And then the intelligence community began circulating what they had put in the president's daily brief to a wider audience. There was a a publication, there is a publication known as The Wire. It includes highly classified information, but it goes to a larger audience, a bunch of consumers, the intelligence community, and most importantly, it goes to overseers in Congress. So by putting this information in The Wire, this more widely distributed, highly classified brief, Mm. They were basically inviting these leakers, these senior CIA officials, these people I call the concerned citizens. They were inviting 
their colleagues throughout the community and in Congress to intervene Mm -hmm. at the last minute before they went further with the late campaign, to intervene with Trump to get him to move, Mm -hmm. to do something about this. They were saying, look, here's the information, you guys. We still have time for a private intervention with Trump. Do it. And what happens is there's no response. Mm. Congress doesn't do anything. Nobody else says anything. Trump continues to sit on his hands. And then there's a last resort. The leak campaign begins. These concerned citizens, these worried leakers inside the intelligence community begin parceling out to the press, first to the New York Times, then the Washington Post, The leaks that will expose the bounty program, and boy, it hits like the bombshell it is. Mm. It blows everybody up. Suddenly, everybody in Congress is worried about it. The administration freaks out. The administration and Trump scream, security breach, security breach, and they demand an investigation of the leakers, a way of distracting attention from the message of the leaks, which is Trump's falling down on the job. And he's letting he's letting Putin get away with murder, murdering American servicemen. And what the White House does, or what Trump does initially, he goes on Fox News, he says the leaks are a hoax, that the intelligence community simply uh, uh, isn't to be believed. They don't believe this material in themselves. And he says, I've been tougher on the Russians than anybody. Well, that's just, that's just bull. In the past few months, just as these leaks, or I should say the bounty information was building up, during that period, he had done all sorts of new favors for Putin. He had, for instance, he'd offered to reopen the G7 membership to readmit Putin. He'd offered to send ventilators to Russia to help combat the pandemic. He had uh, talked about his good friendship with Putin. So he hadn't reacted. He he continued to suck up Mm. to Putin. So the fact is when he says in response to the initial leaks about the bounty program, oh, I'm so, I've been so tough on, on Putin. He's just, he's just blowing smoke. Mm. And More seriously, Hmm. in early July, the White House issued a memo that was designed to answer more formally the leaks exposing the bounty program. Hmm. And in this memo, it's very interesting, you read it. John Radcliffe has just taken over as national d- uh, director of national intelligence, uh, sort of honchoed it. It came out of the National Security Council. It's one of these deftly crass- crafted things. Mm. And the memo, in effect, confirmed everything the leaks had said, uh, except for one thing. It confirmed that, that indeed there had been a, a bounty program, was a bounty program, that the Russians were responsible for it. Um, And it left unanswered or undisputed the allegation that Trump had sat on his hands and done nothing about it. Mm. But what it did do was to try to suggest that the intelligence was so soft that the president was justified in not acting on it. They said in this memo, John Radcliffe, the National Security Council, that the president, he hadn't been briefed on it, vice president hadn't been briefed on it, and that that's because it was just too soft, that the intelligence community realized it was too soft, and that um, there were several agencies that disagreed with the conclusion about the bounties, that the National Security Agency had not been able to confirm absolutely positively that the GRU had spoken to the Taliban about the bounties, although captured prisoners from the Taliban had said that's exactly what happened. So the memo writers quibbled and diced and sliced the onion to try to make it appear there was justification for the president not having received the brief, which he had, and more importantly, for not having acted on the information. Now, as I'm reading this, I keep harking back to Joe McCarthy, and what what Joe did in Joe McCarthy? It was his attacks on the U.S. Army in the 1950s. He was calling everybody uh, communist 
dupe in those days. But when he began suggesting the U.S. Army was complicit with the Russians, that did him in. That was the end of his reign as a as a, a monger of lies. And I kept thinking, wow, how come this doesn't do in Trump? That he's He's basically turned his back on a kill program aimed at U.S. servicemen. You would think of all things, this would blow him up. Mm, he should do, yeah. Well, it did, cre- it did create sudden, a certain stir. Um, Senator Cory Gardner did renew his efforts to get Congress to pass legislation, which it been approved by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee mm, mm. that would label the Russians a sponsor of state terrorism, and that would expose the Russians to all sorts of new sanctions. But the pandemic news has so gotten in the way of things mm. that the stories about the bounty program really haven't created the stir that I thought they would. We may see more. Um But right now, uh, we are in a period of sort of strange stasis, and I suspect the leakers, the guys who were responsible for these leaks in the first place, may be thinking about a round two. I'm not sure what it will be, but Putin remains unchastened. Why do you think Putin went to the risk of creating this bounty program? I think one of the reasons he did so beginning in 2018, was that he believed he could get away with it. Yeah. He believed that Trump was so immobilized by the Mueller investigation that uh, the Russians could basically do anything they wanted to, and Trump would be incapable mm-hmm. of responding to what they did because he was so in- beholden to the Russians and to, and to Putin's discretion. Uh, because Mueller was breathing so hot and heavy on Trump's neck. Now, why? what was happening in 2018? What was happening was this. Robert Mueller was zeroing in on two key witnesses mm. against Trump. The first witness was Paul Manafort, who had been Trump's campaign manager during the time that the Russians were hacking Clinton campaign mm. emails. Mm. Another target of Mueller in 2018 was Manafort's deputy, a guy named Konstantin Kalimnik, whom Mueller identified as being close to Russian intelligence. Mm. Why were these two witnesses so important? Because we know, and Mueller had determined, that Manafort and his buddy Kalimnik, during the 2016 campaign, had discussed Number one, handing over polling data from the campaign to the Russians. Polling data would have enabled uh, Russian hackers and uh, cyber experts to target media dumps of the hacked emails Mm. in exactly the right places, the states, the four, five key swing states, which Trump needed to swing the election in his favor. So these, these, this polling data was extremely important. Mueller had determined that Kalemnik and Manafort were funneling this data to Russian contacts. Okay, number one, that was number one. Number two, Mueller determined that these two guys, Manafort and Kalemnik, had also discussed in 2016 during the campaign a plan to bring peace to Ukraine that would have turned the eastern part of Ukraine over to pro-Putin separatists. Big surprise there. <laughs> That's right. And would made would have had Manafort himself negotiate this deal. Mm. Okay. Mm. This peace plan, Mueller's investigators looked at it and they said, wow, if we're trying to prove criminal conspiracy between Trump and the Russians, it looks like this peace plan is the campaign's quid pro quo for help the campaign was getting from the Russians. Mm. Okay, a little complicated, but suffice it to say, these two guys, Manafort and his buddy Kalimnik, Mm. held the keys to the kingdom. Mm. They were Mueller's best bet for proving criminal conspiracy, the very objective uh, of their investigation. Well, 
What happens in 2018 to blow everything up? This is what happened. Kalimnik, well, first of all, Manafort was convicted in 2018 of bank fraud and tax fraud. He, in September of 2018, offered a plea bargain to Mueller. He says, look, I'll tell everything I know, okay, in exchange for leniency. Mueller says, terrific. We want to hear it. And Mueller begins talking about the peace plan for Ukraine that he discussed with the Russians. He began discussing the polling data. Mm. But Mueller needed corroboration. If he's going to make a case for criminal conspiracy, he needed corroboration. He needed Kalimnik to testify. But Kalimnik was in Ukraine, beyond the reach of Mueller's investigators. At this time, stay with me, folks, it's a little complicated, but at this time, the Trump administration was negotiating with the regime in Ukraine, which was then headed by Petro Poroshenko, mm. a conservative. Uh, he was negotiating, uh, Poroshenko was negotiating with Trump to get Javelin missiles. So he wanted to be very friendly to the Trump administration. His chief prosecutor, a guy named Yuri Lutsenko, had been investigating Manafort, had been offering to provide Man information on Manafort to Mueller. Manafort had been active in Ukraine way back when. All of a sudden, in 2018, during the negotiations for the Javelins, President Poroshenko and his chief prosecutor, Lutsenko, go cold. Hmm. They stop cooperating with Mueller. And most importantly, they allow Kalimnik, the key witness to corroborate Manafort's testimony, they allow Kalimnik to escape to Russia. In short, folks, Poroshenko and Lutsenko, these two top guys in Ukraine, shut down the one avenue Mueller has to proving criminal conspiracy or, collu or collusion. Mm. Okay? Mm. And what happens back in the United States? Once word of this drifts back, guess what? Manafort comes up. He breaks his, his plea deal with Mueller. Mm. He's not talking anything, saying anything more about quid pro quos, about the campaign's dealings with Russia, anything. So suddenly, the whole bloody Mueller investigation begins to stall, mm. begins to stall. And where is Putin in all of this? Putin is in the catbird seat, baby. By the end of 2018, as Mueller's investigation begins to stall, Putin is holding all the aces. He's got Kalimnik under his control. Kalimnik is never going to testify for Mueller. And because he's got Kalimnik under con his control, he's got an either, even tighter grip on Trump. Trump now knows that, that Putin has the witness that could kill him mm. if that witness, that's Kalimnik, ever spoke up. Mm. So though Trump may have been under Putin's thumb before, by the end of 2018, he is totally compromised because Putin is holding cards that could determine how the Mueller investigation goes one way or another. He becomes much more aggressive in his own activities in Afghanistan mm. and is his, in his ambition to sort of supplant the United States. Mm. And I think it's because not merely... Uh, it's not merely because he saw a target of opportunity in Afghanistan. He wanted to displace the United States there. He realized that Trump was simply his puppet now. And I think it affected dramatically uh, Putin's willingness to push the envelope in Afghanistan. Mm. One question, as a former intelligence professional, why... Why would Trump make such an attractive sort of asset to Russian intelligence? 
One of the reasons Trump was such an attractive asset was that he was, as one of the Trump sons noted, mm. dependent on Russian money. Mm. He had he had relied on Russian money and Russian oligarchs to bail out many of his bad investments. And um, that was admitted to by Don Jr. And also go back to the time when Trump was wheeling and dealing as a businessman, as a real estate mogul in New York in the mm. 1980s. Mm. The money that he received uh, came from Russian investors and Russian mafia people in the United States. Mm. The earliest investments in, in Trump Tower came from Russians who were known to have Russian mafia connections, and Russian mafia is very strong in New York. Mm. And the reason this is significant is that one of the things Putin did when he took power was to reinvigorate his old KGB cohorts mm. to marry them with the Russian mafia. And what he did, what he created the perfect power structure for himself, mm. the Russian mafia and his old KGB uh, colleagues. And they upstaged the oligarchs. They brought them under control, those uh, who had basically wheeled and deal once the Soviet Union collapsed. Mm. And Putin was able to strengthen his hand by wedding himself to the Russian mafia. The Russian mafia was all over New York. The Russian mafia insinuated itself into Trump's investments, into his real estate deals. And um, so there was a symbiotic relationship between mm. Trump and and uh, Russian interests in New York. Mm. And as I have mentioned, Christopher Steele, in one of his earliest entries, points out that Russian interests in New York, mm. acting on Putin's behalf, got Trump to begin reporting to them on the activities of Russian oligarchs who were outside or pushing against Putin. Putin wanted to know who these oligarchs were, what investments they had in the United States, and he had in Donald Trump a willing source. Mm. He had someone who was quite willing to help out. And because the money Trump was receiving from Russian middlemen and from Russian investors and mafia in New York. Craig Unger has written about this in a wonderful book called The House of Trump, uh, The House of Putin. And others have written about it as well. So I'm not giving you speculation. Mm -hmm. There has been heavy research on this. And as I said, uh, Trump uh, Jr. has acknowledged that Trump was beholden to Russian money. Um, it's also possible, uh, and this goes to conspiracy theories that have been roundly challenged by Trump defenders, but it's possible that, that the Russians have some sort of compromise that is compromising, compromising material on Trump. And one scenario has it that they had have video of him cavorting with prostitutes at a hotel in Moscow mm -hmm. during the Miss Universe pageant there, which Trump sponsored in 2013. Whether or not that's true or not, we can't be sure. There were curious references to that alleged audio or videotape in the Mueller investigation in a footnote. It mm. never went anywhere, mm. but it got a certain note there, and I was surprised that, that Mueller didn't pursue it. But after all, Mueller didn't pursue a lot of things. He, did not, he didn't uh, interrogate or <laughs> cross-examine I should say, uh, Trump himself. Mm. He didn't interrogate or cross-examine Trump Jr. So a lot of a lot of evidence that could have been mustered to identify the reasons that Putin has such a hold on Trump. Those sources simply were not were not examined or addressed by Mueller. More to the point, Mueller's investigation did not track the money. It didn't examine Trump's finances. So how in the world Mueller arrived at any conclusions of any consequence are beyond me. There were great holes in the evidentiary record. So I think that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. Trump mm -hmm. is so hot on concealing 
his income tax returns. Because if indeed he was so dependent on Russian money for bailing out his bad real estate deals, then it may there may be evidence that he is so in hock to Putin-friendly money men mm. that he is uh, he's effectively a Russian asset or agent of influence. And I think we're eventually going to see more information emerge on Roger Stone, who was Trump's liaison to WikiLeaks, whom everybody knew because it was in the press, mm. was receiving leaked emails from the Russians. So this is not over. We're going eventually to learn why Trump is so beholden to Putin. But And one other thing I think what we should emphasize, since it's so obvious that, that, that Putin has a hold over Trump, yes. this means chaos in the American intelligence community. Mm. The specter that Trump is under Putin's control makes the U.S. intelligence community crazy. It, it makes them unwilling to share information mm. with Trump. Mm. It makes them wary of Trump. It renders them irrelevant as contributors to presidential decision-making. Imagine that. Putin has created such chaos mm. in the U.S. government mm. by creating the impression he's close to Trump that he's basically turned everybody in the government into the paranoids. Mm. Uh, they they are second guessing each other and they're second guessing the president and the mm. US intelligence community mm. won't share information with Trump. What more could Putin wish for? Well, yeah, it benefits Putin. What more could he wish for? It, he has accomplished the perfect psy war operation. He's mm. achieved it. Mm. And the very suspicions he sowed serve his interests by creating chaos in the US government and pitting trump against his intelligence advisors yeah yeah it's much bigger than the uh, cambridge five exactly so and uh, we know what that did to british intelligence yeah. it, it basically immobilized them and and it brought james uh, angleton out of the bushes in langley mm -hmm. and he immobilized the cia so once you begin looking for security leaks your intelligence agency, whether it's British or American, is basically half the strength or half as strong as it should be. And that's that's where our intelligence agencies are now, thanks to Putin's apparent hold on Trump. Mm. One other question I had was about the GRU, because um, when you look at international shen shenanigans, if you put it that way, from assassinations to election interference, the GRU increasingly become the agency responsible for these things. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on, on the GRU and the significance of them being used as opposed to the SVR or FSB. Well, the FSB clearly is the intelligence gathering mm. arm of Putin's intelligence apparatus. But what the GRU is, is it's a combination of all KGB operatives. And I'm talking operatives in the, the real sense. They're the movers and groovers. It's like the CIA in the mm. 1950s. They're not only, they're into dirty tricks. And because the GRU became wedded under Putin's control to mafia interests, they are into real dirty tricks. They are the arm of Russian intelligence, which um, went after the defector in 2006 with radiation poisoning. They went after Skripal and his daughter, mm. Skripal being another defector who lived in, in Britain. And unbelievable to commit attempted murder on British soil. They did it. They were the meddlers, the people that went into the campaign computers of Hillary Clinton during the 2016 election. They were half of that operational arm. They, uh, they are the people who, who've been moving arms to, mm. uh, to Afghan militants and now offering bounties to militants. So, I think the reason they've become so important is because of their mafia component. Mm. And, and Putin is giving them plenty of rain because 
they can make money in the bargain. They can be as corrupt as they want to. Uh, they can enjoy the spoils. So they are an intelligence operation mm -hmm. gone wild. They're the way special operations units, newly created units, were in the later days of the, of the Reagan administration. They'd just been created. There were all sorts of scandals. They were misusing black funds. And I think that's mm -hmm. what's happened with the GRU. They are so rich. They are so powerful uh, that they are, and beholden to nobody but Putin, that they have become... Um, extremely dangerous and mm. and very very audacious and willing to push the envelope and to show putin how the envelope should be pushed uh, one hopes that putin he's controlling them but i think it's mm. a very delicate balance at this point mm. Mm. yeah it's turning into a tom clancy novel isn't it a little bit <laughs> but it, what can what it, on a speculative point um what can actually be done to hold Putin and Russia to account for all these things? Because let's say, let's fast forward a year um, and let's be, po uh, pe uh, not pessimistic, let's be positive about it. Maybe, you know, maybe Trump's gone and all the damage is left. What, what can actually be done um, to hold Putin account to some of these things? Well, the first thing you've got to do is to create or recreate a system of accountability in the United States. You have to report mm. a point responsible intelligence officers who view appropriately uh, Putin as the enemy, not as a friend. And you must immediately, and I hope this will take place under a Biden administration, you must immediately punish those who collaborated with Putin and force mm. them to come clean. Uh, there was uh, a temptation on the part of the Obama administration once it took office to let those responsible for uh, the wheeling and dealing financial skullduggery that led to the recession to let them go free. There were no white collar mm -hmm. prosecutions under those uh, in the those early Obama years. That can't happen. We've got to have Trump and his men held to account. And then that way we can see just how Putin got his hooks into the United States government. There has to be a major house cleaning. And that starts mm -hmm. with accountability. It starts with uh, holding account those who were and have indulged Putin. That's the only way to do it. And then the second thing one has to do is to enforce the sanctions that have been put into effect. Let's not forget, mm. Trump has sort of backed away from the sanctions that were installed as a result of, of Putin's seizure of Crimea in 2014 and his meddling in the elections. It's it's anybody's guess what's happened to these to the sanctions. And it appears that Mitch McConnell has allowed some of the sanctioned individuals like Oleg Deripaska to invest at will in Kentucky, mm. in thus strengthening McConnell's uh, election prospects there. So all of that has to be done away with and examined if we're to make sure Putin doesn't happen again, bounties don't happen again, and that he doesn't continue to hold such a, uh, a deep grasp or have a, such a tight grip of American politics. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up today? Well, I think that uh, one thing I'd like to add is that mm. I am very concerned that what Trump has done is to create such uncertainty about his loyalties. And he's created such chaos when the, within the U.S. intelligence community that our friends abroad, MI6, MI5, uh, French intelligence, have become wary of continuing to share their own secrets with us. I hope mm, mm. that confidence on their part will be restored when a Biden administration uh, is installed. Because if we can't have the confidence of our allies, then, then we're blinded. U.S. intelligence is only half functioning. And that's one thing that Trump has done to us. He's alienated not only our own intelligence operatives and agencies, but he's frightened off our allies, and that has to change. Mm. And a similar thing's happened in Britain in some ways with the Brexit vote as well. There's all sorts of sort of bad blood now between Britain and its uh, European allies as well. Yes, and that is uh, – it's a national security threat. The 
the tensions between Europe and Britain. One thing may save the day, as we all know from our friend John le Carre, British intelligence can sort of operate a little, little on its own and can maintain discrete ties with, uh, say, French colleagues, even mm. if it's mm. not quite um, kosher with uh, whoever may be prime minister at the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's hope for our sake that's happening. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully sorts of uh, people dining out in MI6's uh, dollar, as they say, or pound. <laughs> that's it. Well, look, well, Frank, th- thank you so much for today. Where can listeners sort of find out more about you and your work? I have two websites, Frank Snap dot com and an investigative website where I where I write about a number of topics, any number of topics. Mm. Uh, and that's FrankSnapExclusives.com. I also post on YouTube and have an hour long documentary there called mm-hmm. The Intelligence Failure That Lost Vietnam. So uh, mm. several places that viewers and listeners can tune in. Fantastic. Well thank you very much for joining me today. You bet. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This is Need to Know.